Good morning, everyone. Oh, you're awake. That's great. Welcome to day two of the Aviation 2013 conference. I hope everyone found the conversations yesterday very insightful. I think we had some great um, talks yesterday. Um, Jim Alba led it off with our keynote and gave us some really interesting insights into the state of the industry. Um, you know, pointing out that aviation is vibrant, it's challenging, it's rapidly changing. But our current direction, we really need to pay attention to that. We, have to, we cannot let our industrial base atrophy. We um, have been pushing R&D overseas, which is a bad thing, and we can't allow our infrastructure to decay and lose critical capabilities. And he talked a little bit about the, uh, the need for an overall integrated national policy and, and how to get that started. We also had a panel discussion on the commercial aviation. Uh, that panel discussed possible solutions, things we can do to help the industry, things like uh, instigating a little bit more quickly the uh, next gen system, as well as trying to do some technology demonstrations in a small area to show the customers and show the, uh, the government and show the industry what can be done as opposed to talking about it theoretically, just get out there and do some small scale um, technology demonstration problems, uh, projects, and illustrate that, because that, that will definitely demonstrate what we can do and perhaps instigate things a little bit faster. We also had a cyber panel. We kicked off our cyber effort. And the lands they, over there, they set the landscape for what's going on in cyber. And today, we'll dig down a little bit more deeper into granularity and start looking at how it impacts the industry and what's being done and what has yet to be done. So I think we have a pretty exciting day in front of us. And I'd like to invite Mike Delaney to the stage to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Good morning. Um, as uh, Sandy said, I think we got a great day today. Um, and if uh, the topic at my dinner table last night about cyber and, the, and what it means to our operations and our products and services is an indication, I think we're going to have some really pretty robust discussions um, this afternoon. And we're going to have um, Richard Clark as a keynote speaker this afternoon to, to kick off that session and panel. So it should be pretty exciting. But this morning, we have a, a pretty action packed discussion on uh, military products, and um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, which is Marion Blakey, who is the president and CEO of the AIA, or the Aerospace Industries Association. And as I said, she will give her keynote address on military aviation. Um, immediately following the keynote address, Marion will lead a panel on the same subject um, on military aviation with some esteemed panel members. Um, Marion's very well known in uh, aviation circles. We were talking this morning. I had the privilege of first meeting her when she was administrator of the FAA, and I had the assignment to build the first uh, inerting systems for the Boeing commercial airplanes. But um, she has served as the chief executive in her current position since 2007. Um, she has also been the administrator of the FAA and the ch chairwoman of the National, Transpo uh, excuse, National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB. Under her leadership at the FAA, she was responsible for launching the next generation air transportation system, the shift to the satellite-based system that will modernize air transportation and enable, if you remember my conversation about 35,000 airplanes, um, enabling that uh, ATM is such a key part of uh, enabling the growth of the, of the, of the business sector. Uh, during her tenure at the NTSB, she so oversaw a number of significant investigations and um, during her service at FAA and TSB, she held six presidential appointments, four of which required Senate confirmation. Uh, in addition to her day job, she also serves as chair of the International Coordinating Council of the AIA. She's also on the board of directors of Alaska Airlines, Noblis, a nonprofit uh, science, technology, and strategic organization, and the NASA Advisory Council. She's also vice chair of the President's Export Council Subcommittee on Export Administration. So with that, please welcome me in joining Marion Blakey as our keynote speaker this morning. Thank you, Mike. And I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here. 
Um, when you get an invitation from Jim Albaugh, I'll tell you one thing, you might as well right up front say, the guy has got something good. And it was absolutely true when Jim and Mike invited me to this. I knew it was going to be a very important conference and one where some of the brightest people in our field are gathered. So I can't tell you how delighted and how honored I am to be here speaking to you all today. I also will tell you that the opportunity uh, in this forum and in some of the other sessions today to discuss an issue that I think is absolutely critical to our country, and I'm talking about maintaining American air power dominance. I think this is one of the best things that we could address because I really do consider it one of America's great strategic resources. And I can't think of a better place to, in fact, meet and talk about our power than right here in the heart of the nation's most vibrant aerospace and defense communities. Now look, I know Hollywood gets all the attention, but let's face it, Los Angeles, El Segundo, Huntington Beach, Palmdale, there's so many Southern California locations where the future of air power is taking shape. Here there are talented professionals all across this area that are creating and developing aviation systems that we're gonna find are going to shape our nation's future and help our allies remain safe and secure. Today, you know, we've got the luxury of debating the relative merits of this form or that form of air power. But we should recall it wasn't so very long ago when air power's strategic value was truly uncertain. And there were good people who desperately couldn't wait for some academic discussion about it. They needed results. Now I'm thinking about the spring of 1940. Great Britain knew that darker days were in front of her, just prior to, prior to Hitler's invasion of Holland, Belgium, and France. And Great Britain did know precisely where to turn. The British created what they called a purchasing commission. The idea was to obtain quality, made in America, ships, arms, and yes, aircraft. Knowing of Britain's needs, the president of a US company named North American Aviation, a real entrepreneur, Dutch Kendelberger, approached Sir Henry Self, who was then head of the commission. Kendelberger offered to produce a superior fighter for the Royal Air Force. The commission immediately turned around and responded in a way that Kendelberger himself didn't envision. 320 fighter aircraft with the first delivery, they wanted it in nine months. First fighter came from North American's plant nearby Inglewood. And get this, History records that in a matter of 149 days, slightly less than five months, the first legendary P-51 Mustang was delivered to a very grateful customer. Later, when the United States entered the war, the P-51 superb flying helped cripple the Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe's flying force. Of course, I suspect everybody in this room could tell amazing aviation stories. Stories of how production of various aircraft demonstrated how our industry can rise to the occasion and define what air power will be for the future. It was just four, day, four years after that first delivery, a few months, in fact, after D-Day, that General Dwight Eisenhower and his son John, who was then an Army second lieutenant, they were walking along the Normandy beaches pondering the course of the war. You'd never get away with this if you didn't have air supremacy, said John. Without air supremacy, the general said, I wouldn't be here. The air power revolution that centered on the ability of the Air Force to be able to seize control of the skies and strike targets on land and sea was something that then was the heart of the strategy. Now we see at work new revolutionary trends that again are driven by our country's creativity and our country's dedication. These trends were decisively demonstrated by the U.S. and Allied forces in the two Gulf Wars and in other recent engagements. Our Air Force's ability to precisely navigate, 
stealthily approach a directly hit targets without serious challenge has truly changed the nature of warfare. Today, America's unquestioned air dominance provides the strategic and operational freedom of action that the U.S. military depends upon to succeed in battle. At times, I feel like the leadership perhaps takes for granted that dominance because we are able to act swiftly with minimal ca casualties. The centrality of air power as a national strategic resource is demonstrated by the fact that our military's strategic doctrine is transitioning now. It's transitioning from air land to air sea battle. Air, of course, is the common element. In the future, air power's role could even expand. We look forward to improvements in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance systems. We anticipate long-range strike, having better speed, structured differently, and capabilities. That, coupled with the production and development of low-cost precision strike systems, could allow our country's air power to truly collapse the centers of gravity for a hostile country. However, I'm sure some of you here think She's talking about a pretty optimistic scenario. I'm not a person who usually deals in sports analogies. In fact, they get me into trouble, so hope I'll be on the right side of this one with you all. But one from recent memory I do think is worth noting. At last February's Super Bowl, the Baltimore Ravens were glorying in the fact that they had a seemingly unsurmountable 28 to six lead in the third quarter. The San Francisco 49ers were in the dirt. At the time, I bet a number of you were mentally cashing in your bets, thinking, boy, this game's over. But nothing could go wrong, or could it? Well, you remember? Something did go wrong. A very unexpected surprise in the form of a power blackout. Let the 49ers catch their breath, and catch their breath they did. Remember, they reversed momentum, and they almost came up with a miraculous victory. Let's learn from that sporting event. Because yes, today we do enjoy a very impressive advantage of air power. And it's been 40 years since our aircraft have been seriously challenged. I'm thinking, of course, about Vietnam, where air and ground fire were very dangerous for our pilots for a lot of the war. But our future potential adversaries are already studying and learning from what we're done, we are doing. And they're preparing so that they too can catch up. I thought it was very telling that Under Secretary of Defense Ash Carter made the remark the other day, he said, the world hasn't been waiting while we've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. Even if we don't suffer from an unanticipated surprise akin to a power blackout, major cyber attack, for example, or attack on our satellite systems. We know that there are warning signs we've got to heed. Clearly, underinvestment in the United States military strike capabilities, combined with the aging of our current systems, has very real consequences. They could leave us unable to effectively penetrate determined foes' anti-access and anti-area denial battle networks. And if a crisis comes, these circumstances would be very bitter to contemplate what might follow. Given these stakes, we must commit to air power modernization and not falter in that. Let me submit to you four fundamental reasons why we must assertively pursue this course. First, many of our frontline aircraft are aging. You know it too well, and they've got to be replaced. It's absurd that some of our pilots are flying in the same B-52s in which their grandfathers flew. Also, the rising cost of maintaining these aging systems, the economics don't work, and they make it all that much harder to ensure our current readiness. Second, new threat technologies are going to emerge. They must, and they will challenge U.S. air power systems and the assets that we now are employing. We can all count on that. And third, if we continue on the path to a much smaller overall U.S. force in the future, a higher premium is gonna be placed on the quality of these systems. And fourth, 
Air power assets will most certainly make their greatest contributions in regions such as Asia Pacific. This is, of course, where our current national security strategy dictates that we've got to be prepared to defend regional stability, our own access to the region, and the global commons. The outlines of our required modernization, I think, also are pretty clear. To perform their essential missions, both the Air Force and the Navy have got to develop next generation bombers and fighter aircraft. And lest we forget, the Army is also going to have to upgrade its lift capability as well. The sensible path of modernization would help us achieve the following. A quantum leap in U.S. capabilities to accomplish full dimensional control of the battlefield at all times and in all weather. In such conditions, we can utilize weapon systems smart enough to destroy or disable targets depending on real-time threat assessments, and we can do it with minimal collateral damage and certainly minimal loss of our own air crews. We can have a more flexible, low observable bomber force. This force will respond more quickly to changing conditions and have more distributed capabilities than previous bombers. We'll be able to launch fighters that can fly farther, faster, fight undetected, and fight with advanced weapon systems, possibly even with self-healing capabilities. We'll have a multitude of unmanned aircraft systems that work in unison to enhance our power projections. And we can field an army that under current equipment modernization strategy will have at its command a vastly improved helicopter fleet, greater speed, greater range, greater lift. Of course, I can see among all of you there's some skepticism out here. You're thinking this all sounds good, but how in heaven's name are we going to accomplish something like this in the current fiscal situation? Yep, you've got a point. But unfortunately, essential progress toward force modernization is not something that we can allow to be there as a variable in the wind. And it's very much at risk because of the extremely ill-conceived sequestration budget cuts that we have in front of us. We've seen the impacts already in terms of reduced flying time for the Air Force and for Navy pilots. You may recall that until recently, 13 air squadrons were idled for several months this year. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Given the way DOD chose to fill the sequestration hole in this fiscal year, and the fact that we're living under a continuing resolution now for two years in a row, we're behind schedule on task orders, delaying new starts. It's having a ripple effect all through development and procurement, believe me. The impacts will get worse in fiscal year 2014 when we don't have the cushion of unobligated balances that really were used, I think, skillfully this year, but we won't be able to fall back on that in the next fiscal year. All the while, personnel costs they're going to grow at an unprecedented rate. Beginning October 1st, absent a bipartisan budget solution, and I'll tell you, the picture is very discouraging. DOD is going to have to absorb $52 billion in cuts. It's going to impact everything from current procurement, readiness, and operations to, of course, those critical investments in future capabilities. Combining sequestration with the budget cuts that are already mandated because we shouldn't forget in this current debate that the 2011 Budget Control Act already has a staring at nearly a trillion dollars in defense cuts over the next eight years if sequestration goes through. It's a very perilous fiscal situation. I think Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel had it right on target when he warned recently about the continuation of these cuts. He said, the size, readiness, technological superiority of our military is at grave risk. The Secretary added that cuts will place a much, at much greater risk the country's ability to meet our current national security commitments, and this outcome, he said, is simply unacceptable. It will li limit the country's options in the event of a major new national security contingency. I'm also worried 
about the consequences to our defense industrial base. Right now, the cuts are starting to be felt through the supply chain, contributing to the loss of critical skills and experience that's embodied in what we all know is a very unique workforce. Now, we've been very worried about this at AI, I'll tell you. And so to get a better understanding of what the supply chain is experiencing, back in May, AIA surveyed the small and mid-sized member companies, third, fourth tier, some second tier suppliers. We found 88% have reported impacts from the budget cuts of the last two years. 84% of them have experienced reduced sales and profits. 62% of the companies have reduced their production levels. 60% contract postponements, cancellations, 49% have put in hiring freezes, and 45% have been forced to lay off employees. It's a very bleak picture, and I think the small guys really do not get the attention yet in all of this that is so critical, because as you all know, about 70% of everything that our larger companies are able to supply to the U.S. government, 70% comes up that supply chain. I'm afraid, too, that the wound will get worse as our older workforce decides to retire. And bright young engineers and scientists who are coming out of school, what are they going to think? I think they're going to see some pretty bleak job prospects in our industry. They may very well begin to perceive that careers in aerospace are simply a dead end. As many of you know, for two years, the Aerospace Industries Association and our member companies have put up a very spirited fight against sequestration cuts. And while we've been successful in drawing attention to the national security and economic impacts, the partisan gridlock in Washington simply continues unabated. But we're not giving up by any stretch of the imagination because we've got to forge ahead with both messaging and advocacy to not only spotlight the negative implications of the cuts, but to focus on how vital our industry is in the long term to America's strength and our security. There's a positive message in this that we've got to all be out there promoting because again, I'm afraid too many take it for granted. For example, the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments is developing with AIA's support a new report that's going to be highlighting the critical core capabilities of the national security industrial base. What are those things that we absolutely have to preserve? And they plan to provide this very shortly in September. We hope we'll enlighten the debate. It's going to emphasize the immediate need for a new strategy when it comes to the national security industrial base. There really isn't one right now. And that's something that at this juncture, under the pressures we're all under, we badly need. Because there are going to be real consequences for not having one. We've also engaged a national polling firm. Yeah, you know, we're not really the flash and dash industry, but we decided it was time to find out a bit more about how we're perceived and to learn how we can fine tune our messaging to better resonate with Washington key opinion leaders. So we learned from that polling that the Washington opinion leaders view cyber terrorism and international ter terrorism as much bigger threats than they do the threat from any individual country. Frankly, that surprised a number of us because we did think that China would probably be fairly far up on that list. We're using this information and other survey findings to help influence members of Congress who, while at this point, almost all are sympathetic to our issues, but boy, the number that of late have been much more concerned about the debt and the deficit. That is trumping all the concerns on national security with far too many of our members. And while there's no end to sequestration in sight, I firmly do believe that there's a growing underlying unease in Washington about what these cuts are doing to our national security capabilities. I think eventually that's going to lead to more positive action. For example, the Washington Post is not usually where I go for my good news when I get up in the morning. They're usually not the best friend of disfet spending. But recently they editorialized about this 
And I have to tell you, their aptly named headline says it all. A decaying defense is no defense at all. And that's the post. So to wrap up, I'd like to conclude with some thoughts about what we should be doing as a nation, even in these tough fiscal times, to preserve the strategic resource that is air power dominance. Let's begin with funding. I believe that all of us, every one of us in this room, should continue strongly advocating for stable and predictable defense budgets for our aviation forces. A sane defense budget won't sacrifice readiness, operations, or investments in future defense capabilities on the altar of budget austerity. The Post editorial demonstrates that we're not a lone voice in this, and we can make a difference. We can and must reverse the mindless cuts that are falling on us now. There are also some policy improvements that we should be seeking, independent of the budget situation. Let's push DOD to take a long-term approach to managing the national security industrial base, while there's an opportunity still to really preserve the key elements. To further help industry, I believe the government can institute more affirmative policies to promote defense exports. We need a clearly defined and effectively implemented national defense export strategy. Again, one doesn't exist. And when the time was that our domestic market satisfied a great deal of our company's capabilities, that was one thing. But boy, things have changed. The strategy would promote U.S. defense exports as the foundation for international security cooperation. It would support the projection of U.S. power, and it would encourage the sharing of global security responsibilities by supplying the necessary capabilities, the ability to act seamlessly together to our allies and our partners. Finally, we in industry can do a better job as well making the defense spending dollar go further. We can help identify areas of efficiencies in the acquisition system so that we can make the process of procuring new platforms and systems much more streamlined and less costly than it is today. All of these policy prescriptions could go a long way to setting up conditions in which our country can move forward with air power modernization. And, you know, if we sometimes get frustrated in our current situation, I have to fall back on an old bromide, but it's one that I find a bit of comfort in because it's the words of another British official from World War II. You all know it. We can always count on Americans to do the right thing, said Sir Winston Churchill after they've exhausted all the other possibilities. <laughs> Let's not exhaust them all. Let's move forward on some of these policy shifts that we can make, and let's be the most powerful advocates we can for what is absolutely critical for our country's future, air power superiority and our ability to protect our national security. So thank you for having me today. I'm delighted to be here. Now, if there are any questions or ideas and advice, I'm big on getting ideas and advice, especially from smart groups like this, please let me know. I'd be happy to take a few questions. Early in the morning. Right here. Raising an excellent point. Um, the recent win uh, back at the beginning of the year on moving satellites from the munitions list and from a very restrictive commercial satellites to the commerce control list. Actually, this was a piece of legislation that took 10 years to overturn. It was quite extraordinary because we are seeing a significant uptick in commercial satellite capabilities again in this country. Uh, during that 10 years, we went from over 70% of the market to 29%.
So this was huge. And we do have to be vigilant. The administration, I think, has really uh, done a great deal in terms of shifting our export control policy to one that really does protect the highest technology and at the same time has moved literally thousands of items from the munitions list to the commerce control list. They have an ambitious agenda in this second term of the presence, and we're doing everything we can to help them carry through on it because export control reform is at the heart of our being able to forward the kind of export policy that we want to see. I'd mention one other specific thing in that regard, because anything you all can do as you're t talking about these things together would be good. I fear we stand the same kind of liability with unmanned aircraft or aerial systems that we did with commercial satellites. And the reason is a different restriction called the Missile Technology Control Regime, MTCR. Right now, the United States is highly restricted in terms of what we can export. And we're far and away the world's leaders when it comes to UAS technology. But we cannot expect to sit on that lead. And there are many other countries that are coming up fast behind us. So if we cannot shift so that we can be a part of the global market, I can tell you right now, that's another part of our industry that's going to be in real peril. So we need to be out there pushing to see that reformed and changed. Right here. The state of next year. Well, you know, I tell you this, I of course wish it had gone farther faster, we all do. Um, but I will also say this, um, Paul Kaminsky, uh, at one point, when I could not literally, you, when you leave government, you go through a cooling off period and you can't contact your former agency and I needed someone who could represent us to the agency on next year. So got Paul Kabinsky, former undersecretary of ATNL, and it was fascinating to bring the mentality of systems engineering and program management from his vantage point to it. I tell you this because Paul said at the end of the day, he said, this is the most complex systems engineering challenge I have ever seen. It far surpasses any of the programs at DOD. So I say that because I do want us to all appreciate they're trying to bring online the various elements that will allow us to move to a satellite-based digital system, uh, one where Datacom and ADSB are all functioning smoothly, uh, is a big challenge. Now, in terms of specific components, we just about got the ADSB ground stations in, so I think that is moving relatively smoothly. Uh, the issues involving Datacom are real, but the backbone of the system, ERAM, uh, which will govern the interplay between these and the en route systems is almost complete. So if you look at the component parts, I think there's reason to be encouraged. Uh, there also are some big challenges in it, but the biggest challenge of all, of course, is the amount of money that FAA needs to spend on next gen is right at a billion dollars a year. And that has tremendous ROI. The return on investment on this as soon as that system is implemented and the airlines are equipped is enormous, but billion dollars is just about what the FAA is going to lose under sequestration every year. And I don't think I have to tell you all that when you've got a choice and you're running an agency that has operational responsibilities, running the NAS, you know where the money's, where it's going to have to go first. And so we will see the seed corn, we will see the investment accounts sacrificed to keep the system currently running with radar and radio. You know? So, again, I worry very much about the future. Right here. Well, I do think that we're in a period right now, uh, because the issue is how can we engage the public 
more in support of aviation, both commercial as well as military, and the benefits that they bring. Um, I think we need to be much more powerful advocates, but I also think some of the technologies that we're bringing online are going to be very exciting as the public looks forward to what we can do. Um, you know, the carrier landings of the X-47 the other day. I mean, that was front page almost everywhere, and that's pretty damned exciting stuff when a UAS is able in a pitching sea to plant down accurately, and we can look forward to that capability in the future. I'll tell you, when I stand in line at um, the desks, the gates uh, around at airports, I hear people ask, do you know what aircraft it is? It's the 787. People are genuinely excited about game-changing aircraft and what they can do for the flying experience. So I do believe that more championing of the technologies themselves, more talking about what we do. Obviously, it would be very exciting if we could do more with some flight demonstrations. Jay Wan Shen is sitting right here from NASA, and Jay and I have talked many a time about the potential for X-planes and what we can do in the future that captured the imagination so well in the past. So there is a lot in front of us. There's a lot that can be very exciting. Um, but I also think trying to reduce the hassle factor in the flying experience, trying to have people understand that it doesn't always have to be this way. Uh, if we're willing to spend the money on some of the technologies that mean curb to curb, not just gate to gate improvements will be made under the new next gen system. You know, the seamless integration of data, security information, et cetera, all of that could change things dramatically. So I see that there are a number of areas in which if we're willing to continue to push forward, I think we will have people, you know, who are as excited as we are about aviation in its future. Any other questions? Right here. Uh, You've mentioned about the survey where they were talking about cybersecurity. Can you share your thoughts on what are the next steps the aviation sector needs to take in protection of our critical assets in the transportation Yeah, cybersecurity, I think, for all of us, aviation is certainly one of the sectors where um, we must pay a great deal of attention to what is a genuine threat by anyone's imagination. Uh, we do have the advantage, I think about other industries, you know, uh, information technology, banking, et cetera, and they're all working very hard against constant bombardment and constant threat. We are too. Our companies are experiencing the same. However, we do have the advantage of being the leading edge really those who are inventing and developing solutions. And what goes on in the classified world and what goes on in supporting DOD and supporting the kind of safeguards that have to be there also is and will bleed over into the commercial sector. So, you know, as we're talking about these things, I do believe that we do have a unique advantage from that standpoint, but attention must be paid. And there's no question about the fact that we all very much fear the vulnerability of the system. I used to take some rather perverse um, p comfort in the fact that the FAA's old system before ERAM came into place was written in a language called Jovial. How many folks in this room have you ever heard of Jovial? Ah, yes, I'm in with some engineers here. How many of you all know anybody who can write Jovial? One, two, that's what I mean. It used to, as I say, be a source of some comfort to say, nobody's going to hack in here because there's nobody who knows it. It's so archaic. But no, we're all moving into more open architecture and broader capabilities. And as we do, the vulnerabilities will get greater. But I do believe our industry is really very leading edge in that regard. Unless there are any other questions, I think I will stop there because I know we have a lot going on this morning. But I want to thank you again, because as I say, this is obviously a smart, engaging group, and I encourage any of you all who are interested in pursuing 
future systems and what this is all going to be about, please come join our panel. We have got a great group of real stars who are going to be talking about this in a few minutes. So thank you again.